Hello. Hi, so I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Stuart. I work for uh, a company called Rackspace. Look, giant company logo, isn't that brilliant? Uh, I work on uh, the Drizzle project. Uh, so Drizzle uh, is what we refer to as database for cloud. So it's a relational database system. Uh, we originally forked off uh, the now defunct MySQL 6.0 tree, although it looks a lot different now. Uh, so it's best to think of it as more of an independent database that has uh, common heritage rather than a branch of MySQL. So uh, Rackspace sponsors a couple of developers. We have actually lots of developers over a bunch of companies and students and everything, so it's not a giant monoculture. It just so happens that uh, someone is willing to pay me money to hack on stuff I love. Uh, so I wanted to talk about first uh, some of the goals of the project. Uh, so wanting to write, have a modern uh, relational database system uh, for cloud. So what do we think about uh, when, we, when we talk about Drizzle? Uh, one of the goals was to have it much more pluggable. Uh, to actually have the database server be highly modular and be able to switch in bits that you actually wanted. And bits that you didn't want, you could take out. And if you didn't like the implementation of authentication, you could easily write your own. Uh, this was also to reduce sort of the core size of the code base. So if you ever look at uh, the MySQL server code base, it is massive. Drizzle, we've now managed to get sort of the kernel, uh, the core of the, uh, of the database server, down to something like a single human could understand. It is conceivable that a single human could understand the entire core of uh, core of the code, uh, and as well as you know, improvements in code quality make that a lot easier. We wanted to make it infrastructure aware. So as soon as you have people running uh, sort of more than one database server, more than two, you know, one, two, three is quite easy for a single human to remember sort of what's there. And if you had you know different users, you could kind of you know add them everywhere. So you don't really start having uh, huge amounts of infrastructure, but with larger installs, or when you have lots and lots of users, especially in a multi-tenant environment, you start to have, well, if there's this, all these modules and bits of software over here that need different kind of auth and different kind of this and different logging, it starts to get a real pain in the ass. Uh, so we wanted Drizzle to be infrastructure aware. So if you had existing authentication systems, you just plug into that. If you had your existing logging systems, you just plug into that uh, and actually become part of the general infrastructure of uh, uh, large systems instead of having to fit everything around the database server. It's a part of your infrastructure. It does not dictate it. It is not the one great big database that everyone much worship. Uh, it is part of everything else. A big thing we wanted was to be community developed. We didn't want to have uh, a single uh, hidden group of developers somewhere uh, dictating everything. We wanted to have large uh, community around being developing and decisions making. And one of the interesting things is when you have uh, like RDBMS is used in like sort of cloud and large scale environments is you really want to listen to a bunch of users and people adminning these things. There's like a gray area between developers and sort of DevOps here. And it's like you really can actually give a lot more crap about someone who's actually running this on a thousand machines, uh, what they're saying compared to what I'm saying when I'm spending all my time in the code. So there's really kind of a bit where you actually want to listen to what people are saying and saying, actually, you know, if you just made these three changes, then it like, you know, saves us, you know, a week, a month is something you really want to hear. We really wanted to pay attention to multi-core. Uh, it turns out that uh, Buying a single core CPU is really hard. Uh, <laughs> buying a, 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 a box that's you know in a couple of rack units that's got a couple of hundred uh, CPU cores actually isn't too hard. Uh, and so this get, getting it's obviously a trend that your commodity crappy R systems that you're using to get a large number of them to assemble sort of your know, cloud and high availability stuff. Uh, they're all multi-core, so we actually need to use these processors uh, in a way that's sensible. Uh, our current big idea is the fact that you do want to do you know, lots of different I.O. across many CPUs, but you run a single connection on basically a single CPU, and you uh, do a parallel thing by having lots of simultaneous connections. So this tends to work out fine. People aren't generally running a website where uh, having a query that only runs on a single CPU is a problem. CPUs are fast enough where that's okay. Uh, this also makes a whole bunch of locking uh, a lot easier, because if you don't have mutexes around all the individual parts of executing a query, guess what? You never have lock contention. So we also wanted to do concurrency. The fact is that a thousand connections to the database isn't that many. A thousand connections is kind of like common. So we actually will always, uh, 
what we'll say is we'll always take the option that makes a thousand uh, concurrent connections faster uh, instead of the one that makes you know 16 faster. Uh, if you only have 16 concurrent connections to the database, you're not going to be fully using your machine properly, uh, or you're doing more analytic stuff, and that's fun too. But uh, we have a web focus. Uh, we are not constructing the world's best analytic database engine for running a query that takes three days. Um, we sure would love to enable it. We're focusing very much on like modern web apps. So enable others, that in saying don't you know, necessarily make it that we'll never accept anyone's patches. I mean, sure, write patches, turn it into a giant analytics system. That'd be great. Uh, but we definitely wanted to be able to have a web focus. This is a nice one. It turns out that other people have written uh, linked list implementations uh, and hashing libraries and UUID libraries uh, and, and uh, command line argument parsing. Uh, <laughs> and we didn't need to have our own separate buggy, buggy implementations. Uh, also, perhaps, you know, we could fix the common code base if it was broken and didn't perform as well. We could fix that and then everybody wins. <laughs> it's like, it wouldn't just be, hey, we've made our command line option parsing really fast and has like this one extra feature. It's like we could just do that to everything. Uh, so we do, in fact, have uh, a great uh, reuse of libraries and using existing libraries. So uh, this doesn't mean we have some build dependencies, but you know that's what package management is for. Uh, so you know if you're running you know, OS 10, <laughs> your own fault. Uh, but if you're running something like a Debian-based system, then it's really easy. App get build dep. Uh, oh my God, it works. Uh, so we're using like a Google Protobuffer library for doing some uh, lovely data structures that we serialize and unserialize, uh, including we're using that for uh, the replication stream. So it's like really nice and possible. Uh, and good fun, but we also use Boost. Uh, so we modernized the code base, and the MySQL code base was in kind of the best described, it was written in C. Sign <laughs> of taking the worst aspects of everything and combining it into a code base, uh, which was great when compilers never actually parse the same thing. Uh, but guess what? C compiler is actually okay, so we went one of two directions. It was, do we make this an entirely C-based code base or a C++ code base? And it turned out that the easiest way to go was actually go to a C++ one, and there were some benefits with that as well. Uh, there's some great reasons to use C and C++ has some horrible brain damage, stupid ass things, uh, but on the whole it's worked out fairly well. Using boost libraries are actually a fairly nice collection of stuff. There's some really useful nice, easy to use stuff in there. I mean, we're even using like the command line parsing stuff and that gets pretty neat. Uh, of course, C++ compilers are slower, but you know, if that doesn't affect end users, it just makes me complain, uh, which turns out to be like the economic thing to do is to have all your users happy and... <laughs> so we have some values of the team. We're very much into open and documented interfaces. Uh, so we want, you know, network protocols to be documented and people to be able to write separate implementations. Uh, that being said, our Network uh, protocol client library is BSD licensed, so no more about if you have to GPL this thing of inside your client apps, just BSD licensed client library. Very easy because no one wants another licensing discussion. Uh, we wanted to have uh, sane interfaces inside the server. What we wanted to do is be able to have it very easy to whip up extra things that you might need. Also, we want it very easy for ourselves to add things like that, where someone says, hey, what if it did this to make it really easy to be able to experiment? Uh, and also be able to prove that parts of the code were correct by saying this is obviously correct code. Uh, and really a step in that direction was great. Uh, transparency, I mean, RC, mailing lists, stuff on Launchpad, having it all transparent and open means that you know, anyone can go and report uh, you know, bugs and problems and suggestions and it's a real nice place to be. Uh, also because you know, fun is utterly important and requires a 300 point font. I wanted to make sure it was a pretty decent community ham, and it is. Uh, collaboration with people. Uh, we wanted, of course, to have everyone talk to each other and make it easy for people to contribute and participate, not a closed, gated off community. Uh, and also, we really wanted to make it possible for people to build businesses around Drizzle, not just us in whatever form we wanted to do, uh, but we did want to make it possible to people to create extra bits on there, use it as a service, run you know, uh, database as a service type thing and deploy it in cloud stuff and build businesses around it. So why did we start Drizzle in the first place? Uh, we wanted to rethink everything. Uh, how do we do databases? How do we implement? How do we manage this kind of thing? We didn't want to play catch up with any of the world. We wanted to leap forward. So for example, uh, we do not 
take the option of, oh, but that will be slow on 32-bit systems. This is about the only 32-bit system you can still buy. Uh, <laughs> funnily enough, people aren't building clouds out of phones. Uh, lots of RAM. Uh, we can use RAM for a lot of things instead of ever hitting disk. Uh, UTF-8, we do not do ebc -DIC. Uh, we do not do weird-ass character encodings. Once it hits the database, it is in UTF-8 uh, and have valid UTF-8 going on there. And it's up to four bytes currently, so that's pretty neat. Uh, so basically, it is binary data or it is text, and that is UTF-8. Yes, everybody wins. Everybody, everybody wins. Um, modular, of course, was our thing to have lots of different pluggable bits. Uh, and this means we have, of course, the same pluggable storage engine interface. I have done a lot of work making that a lot more sane uh, so that bugs are a lot less likely and are much more likely to be spotted. Uh, so we also have sort of features developing around that. One of the things that I'm sort of working towards is even like transactional DDL, uh, which will be like uber, uber cool to be able to do multiple DDL operations and roll them back, uh, including uh, improving the interface so you could actually have crash safe DDL. Uh, MySQL does not have crash safe DDL. I fixed it. Uh, so you can actually pull the plug around certain parts of doing DDL operations and you will guarantee to come back. Uh, so that's a thing that engines can provide, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, functions, so SQL functions in there, very pluggable. It's been like that in MySQL for a while too. We've switched it to have the same API when it's built in versus a, a module. Uh, so you can actually just easily choose whether you compile these in or load them uh, up uh, as a, as a module. Uh, we don't do runtime module loading. It's restart the database server because it turns out that that makes like you know, locking structures about what plugins you have loaded and what's being executed really easy if you only ever do it at startup or shutdown. So we save locks. Uh, very modular replication system. Uh, so the big thing that we're getting to the point now, uh, so we're nearing what we would call a GA release, a stable release. Uh, I will say sort of next month is kind of the time scale for that uh, and sort of been in beta for a while. And one of the things we did uh, early on was examine the replication code and went, do we want to keep this? Like, we've been ripping a whole bunch of stuff out that didn't quite work properly. And we looked at the replication stuff and went, no. <laughs> we can start from scratch and implement something on top of there. So we do uh, row-based replication, which means that we don't log SQL statements and apply as replication. Turns out the naive way, uh, which is statement-based replication, which is to say, well, you have these bunch of SQL statements and you run them on the master. You save off that list of SQL statements and run them on the slave and you should get the same data. No, uh, it turns out it is actually impossible to get that right. Like really impossible. You get rid of it, you sort of make it work by doing a bunch of tricks. Uh, for example, you know, if you see the replication log, oh look, there's like a random number generated. Well, you see the random number generator, you see what dates everything are recording half this, and then you have to make sure it's the right you know, SQL mode and kind of things, execute the right order, and then you actually have to do different types of locking inside the database just so statement-based stuff works. And it's like, well, that's wholly inefficient. Uh, we don't want more locking. We want less options for uh, uh, locking contention. Uh, so row-based replication it is. This is obviously correct. Uh, it's a very modular architecture, as in the fact there's uh, the code that starts writing the transaction log just hooks into common points inside the code to say, you know, after a row has been written or updated or deleted, you know, call all the modules that want to hear about that and you can do something with it. Um, so you could uh, write a plugin that instantly, I don't know, tweeted each row. I'm sure the Twitter guys would love that. Um, <laughs> someone, yeah, someone once wrote a Java uh, class that did like logging, but to Twitter, and like people were following us on their phone, and I was talking to one of the Twitter guys and go, hey, look, it was like 84% of our traffic at one point. Uh, <laughs> Uh, people getting paged with log messages. So you could do that, but uh, the stuff that writes replication log, common API, uh, it's also a very easily parsable replication log. There is no dependence on drizzle to drizzle replication. Uh, you could quite easily replicate this to any other system you want. A simple way is to transform it back into SQL statements, not necessarily the original SQL statements, but one that's, that would have the same effect. Uh, you could replicate this to drizzle using some kind of native uh, thing that will come across, quite easy to transfer it into stuff that you could replicate to Postgres, uh, or in fact, a system that does not speak SQL at all. As long as you can kind of make it look like a relational database, as in you could kind of work out where to put you know, a table and rows, uh, you could replicate to it, which is kind of neat. Even 
create table currently works in there and drop. We're going to have alter in there as kind of like this wonderful big data structure because it turns out that uh, alter table operations, you think, oh, that's easy. Just store before and an after description of the table. Yeah, that doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> there's actually alter table operations in uh, SQL that you can do where that would break. You know, you can do as a single alter table statement, drop a column and add a column with the same name. If you did before and after there, did you change the type and preserve the data, or did you drop it and add it? So you really want to be careful around stuff like that. So modular replication is going to be very cool. Uh, logging, of course, uh, one of the earliest plugins we implemented was log to syslog. Oh my god, log to syslog, it just makes sense. Uh, there's also stuff to log to uh, like, uh, Gearman, which is a job queue system, or log to anywhere else you want, uh, which is pretty neat, or to standard error. It's the real simple one that actually, I think, took longer than the syslog one. Uh, authentication. Uh, why do you want to have yet another copy of your entire user's database in a database server? Just link to your existing one. So there's auth HTTP, which does, actually does uh, HTTP auth requests uh, to see whether you can log into the database, which is kind of cool, which was uh, uh, what someone wanted. Uh, there is, of course, auth PAM. So if you did just want to authenticate people to the database via LDAP, you just can use auth PAM and you're done. Or like use your login password in your laptop, right? Doesn't that presume you want to bring people to actually understand how to configure PAM? <laughs> yeah, I hear both people who know how to configure PAM properly are, are really into it. Um, Is the authorization plug as well? Yes. Yeah. So that's a bit that's not it's not like fully fleshed out with as many plugins yet, um, but certainly that is a bit that's definitely going to get there more. I mean, we ripped out the whole auth system initially and said, you know, we're not sure exactly what we want in here. We're pretty sure we want it to be pluggable and not what is there now. Because um, people were like, you know, replicated everywhere. Uh, one of the big things we're doing at is multi-tenancy as well, which is, I shall talk soon. Modular protocol, there is no reason why someone could not write a HTTP uh, JSON REST interface to do it. Uh, we currently have sort of a MySQL protocol, uh, wire compatible and our in-development sort of drizzle network protocol. And we'll probably see like, you know, uh, memcache style ones and HTTP style ones as well uh, to access the same database, which is kind of cool. Uh, you can plug into certain bits of the parser, which is kind of cool. Uh, virtual tables, so like uh, information schema and data dictionary. Uh, so we have two sort of uh, databases that, you know, don't really exist that you can query about uh, what, data, what tables are stored. Uh, information schema is the SQL standard information schema. If you write a query in Drizzle against the information schema, uh, schema uh, or database uh, would be the way to not repeat the word too many times, that will be able to run on anywhere that implements SQL standard. We have no extra stuff in the information schema database. If you write a query that only acts as an info schema, that is a portable query. Oh my god. Data dictionary is the stuff where it's like, yep, you get all the internals and all the extra info we have. So you pretty much know that if your query is against data dictionary, it is dependent on Drizzle. And we could change that in a future version as well. But you get all kind of cool internal things as well. So we have stuff about, you know, you know GB uh, transaction records, uh, what locks are being held by what, and all that kind of lovely deep delved stuff where you're going to go, oh, the lock's being held on that source line. Uh, brilliant. Uh, we also have a plug plugin point called row events. Uh, which gets to this really cool idea of just say you may not want to store your blobs inside the table on that machine. Maybe you want to store all the blobs in the database off on like a cloud storage system. So there's actually like a blob streaming plugin that's, um, uh, that can also work. So it'd be great if people test it more as well, uh, where actually it gets a hook in before you write the row of the database. Oh, we'll rip out the blob and replace it with a URL. And so you can actually just easily store this off in other places, or modify it and do whatever evil stuff. But uh, plug-in points, not hard-coded features, right? So what are the sort of key features? The one big thing that, of course, we are transactional by default. Um, if you type create table, you get a transactional tables. Um, you cannot, we keep my ISM as a temporary only engine currently, so you can create session only temporary engines, uh, temporary tables, uh, mainly because uh, uh, SQL executor will create them as temporary ones to do some uh, queries, which we will hopefully make into a plug-in point uh, sooner. If anyone is really interested in the deep down delves of that, you know how you would normally implement this, where you'd have like a function called create table, and you'd specify, you know, this is what you want, and you'd call that internally as well. So you pass the SQL into it, and if you're executing a query, you'd construct this data structure and do that. Yeah, that's not how it works. Uh, it constructs the data structures for the open table, uh, and it's like really hairy to pull apart. So. Uh, that's uh, taken some time to get rid of my ISM completely. 
but transactional by default, which is in ODB engine. How far along are you in making RVR transactional? So, uh, what transactional? The, how, how far along are you in making the row based replication transactional? No, that's all it solid, is. yeah. It's all solid. Yeah. Cool. Our QA guy can now no longer crash it or get differing results. We are looking for new and interesting ways to corrupt the replication log. Our big thing was first before we create huge, you know, slave infrastructure and fancy stuff was like we should be able to run, you know. So we have this tool called Rangen, which is a random query generator, uh, which is basically you specify like a lex-like grammar of possible SQL queries to construct. You then run this program that then runs a whole bunch of you know like 64 processes and randomly generates queries uh, based on this grammar that would be passed by this grammar. And this usually means like when the guy originally wrote it first ran it against MySQL server, it was like <laughs> someone asked, "Are you going to like verify the results of like you know the inserts and selects?" And his reply was, "When I can stop crashing the server within five SQL queries, I'll think about it." <laughs> so you can just construct horrible things that do there. And we actually. Uh, are at the point where doing random operations in there, which is more than anyone will write by hand. Uh, you can have this running for you know, hours, and there's no difference in, in the replication log from what's actually in the database. So we're pretty solid on that. Uh, and it does transaction boundaries properly. It does save points properly. It does uh, rolling back of individual statements properly, and all sorts of fun stuff like that, including you know, huge transactions and, and doing stuff like that. So it does that properly and without you know, consuming all your memory if you decide to update two gigabytes worth of stuff. Uh, so yeah, there were some really good, fun, subtle bugs <laughs> uh, as well. But we use NODB, transactional engine, as well as we have in the tree other transactional engines. We have PBXT in there as well. So there is options, plugins work. Uh, of course, logging, mentioned you know, syslog and the like. Yay. Anyone who tailed MySQL logs could understand it's annoying. Uh, Replication, I've mentioned, lots of good plugin points for doing that. Uh, we have a simple one to go to a file. We have stuff that could send, uh, send uh, replication messages directly to something else. Uh, and currently, we're going through uh, making the tungsten replicator work. So it is a uh, replicator, sort of a filtered replicator thing. This idea is it replicates from any database to any database. The drizzle part of that is probably the simplest one of all the other ones. It doesn't involve you know, parsing the MySQL binary log format or anything silly. Uh, so that's kind of fun. Uh, Author mentioned PAM strict mode by default. We don't have a SQL variable called strict mode. It is strict mode by default. We do not accept bad data. You cannot insert into a, a uh, you know, a bar chart field like invalid UTF-8. You get an error. You can't try and insert into like an enum field, something that is not in the enum. Uh, you cannot, you know, have truncated data. You do not sort of just suddenly, I'll go insert, you know, five billion into a integer column with 30 bits kind of throws you an error. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, one of the cool uh, features we have also is the file system engine, which is actually a Google Summer of Code project. Uh, it's basically designed to be the what the CSV engine really should be. It's like you have some files that are structured kind of-ish that you'd like to read as a database table because it's easy to run SQL queries across 100 machines and collate the data. Uh, this sort of reads a reads files, you say, you know, rows separated by, columns separated by, uh, or whether it has titles. So you can read, like, prop, proc memstat as a table. You can read, uh, you know, any, anything in Etsy, like password, you can read that as a table, because that'll be great. Uh, and any of the proc things, you can actually read these out as database tables. So instead of having to have sort of another way to gather stats, if you're just already gathering stuff out of your database system, you can read that. And I even use that for, like, analytic stuff when people send me CSV things, because spreadsheets scare me. If you wanted to make that into MySQL, or yeah, or, or, to, or could you use that like I, I have to do that all the time, usually in processing stuff into CSV, so then you can just do read it as CSV. Um, you can easily like create two tables in the file system engine, one CSV and one's the other format. And just you know, insert select would do that automatically. Um, if you wanted to run that inside a MySQL thing, it would require code porting and hacking, because the interfaces around part of it are actually quite different. But um, it's pretty easy to use. And you can also just run it, as, you don't actually start off a server, we have a. So the network protocols are pluggable, pluggable. We also have one called console, which doesn't start off a network server port. It just starts an interactive session on the console for one user. So it's like, <laughs> specify data to a console and just run stuff. How can you just run that, like, just as a command? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly like SQLite does, but you have like a lot more heavyweight database that you're not using. Uh, <laughs> it's 
kind of interesting thing. But yeah. Yeah, but handy. <laughs> I've been meaning to write just a little shell script that just sorts what you have to type, because uh, I get sick of it. From your phone? From your phone? Eh, maybe. Uh, actually, we also recently support the MySQL Unix socket pro protocol as well, just for giggles. Um, we have data migration tools. Uh, so Drizzle Dump is like the turbo accelerator version of sort of MySQL dump. Uh, it can actually suck data out of a MySQL uh, server, uh, translate the column types that we don't have to something that we do support, and you know appropriate time things. For example, the MySQL time type supports negative time, which is like not in the SQL standard. Our time type actually follows the SQL standard. Uh, so we like translate that into integers and stuff that don't eat your data. Uh, so we actually have uh, Drizzle Dump will actually suck data out of the MySQL server and just transfer it directly into a Drizzle server and not have to, you know, dump it to disk first, which is kind of nice. Uh, so data migration from MySQL thing is pretty easy. Uh, Multi-tenancy stuff is like cool new things we're working on. So you may have heard that people will like, you know, have many users with independent databases on the same MySQL install, like shared hosting is one, or if you're doing cloud-like stuff, you'll have, you know, a lot of customers customers there who do not use the capacity of a machine. Uh, they use a tiny amount of it, or you only want you know, small amounts and then to grow out. So there is a thing in SQL standard called catalogs, uh, which is basically a separate namespace. You used to, you know, database table. So catalog is one above that. So each catalog has their own set of schemas, and each schema has its own set of tables. So if you give someone their own catalog, their idea is they can write, you know, create database or create schema and go to their heart's content, instead of like the current way if you're doing multi-tenancy with a MySQL and you let people create new databases is you have to create, you know, some new abstraction on top of that that prefixes with their username and something there and make sure that they can't screw with you. Or you say you get one schema and hopefully all the apps you want to run don't have conflicting table names <laughs> uh, if you wanted to do that. So we have catalogs which is a layer across that. So you don't do queries, SQL queries across catalogs, you can't join between catalogs. They're largely independent. We're looking at stuff, for example, to have uh, in the next couple of months, this is probably something I have to implement, uh, to have like uh, allocate to each catalog a certain amount of the buffer pool. So you can say, you could say as an offering say, this user is guaranteed to get 100 meg of cash uh, instead of having it fall off the end because there's one user on the box that you know, uses a lot. You have more guarantees around that as well. Could that be to processing the like, CPU time and the like? Yeah. yeah. And you could, like, for example, a simple thing could be, you know, you have a catalog and you can choose whether you want, you know, 10, 100, or 1,000 simultaneous connections supported and, you know, price it accordingly or know when someone wants a bigger one, you migrate them to a bigger machine or multiple ones, that kind of thing. So, I mean, this is, we're getting all the basic infrastructure in place uh, now and then it's, you know, adding on these really cool things there. But uh, you know, there's even, like, a lot of base work to get done to actually to do it properly. And to specify this via the protocols so will be all nice. Or run it on disc different ports or something easily like that. Uh, another feature which I love, oh my god, testing. <laughs> uh, we're really good, we're really insistent about not killing performance with like subsequent commits. So we have like Hudson building stuff and running benchmarks on special benchmark machines and graphing it over time, that kind of thing. Uh, we do, uh, you know, build everything with dash w error and a whole bunch of compiler warnings on that the flags are huge uh, kind of thing doing it. So we want as much testing as possible. With cleaning up a bunch of APIs, uh, one of my favorite pastimes is writing new storage engines that actually just return sort of weird stuff to the upper layer to, to test other parts of the upper layer for specific error conditions. So I more want to test error conditions to make sure error handling works uh, and stuff like that. Uh, as well as having a larger regression suite so you can actually make sure that you don't reintroduce bugs, re uh, have more code coverage, that kind of thing. As well as running things like the random query generator, which is just, you know, this crazy piece of stuff uh, that's awesome. Um, as well as having standard run these five commands and see what breaks uh, kind of thing. Uh, open source database testing has typically... So the current state of the art that we have is probably at least 10 years behind Microsoft's. Uh, we're sort of doing now what they were doing at the end of the 90s. So we're a bit, uh, all open source databases are a bit behind here, but you know, we're trying to catch up and be work smarter, not harder. So all automated systems, because you know, there's not infinite number of people. Uh, we have some pretty cool stuff coming for the future. 
catalog support, that kind of stuff, uh, having a lot more cooler interfaces to make it uh, nice to work with that. But we're getting to the point where it's actually like, we're pretty solid. I would say you can run this and not be a problem. The replication log is getting solid, which means we can start making sure all the slave apply stuff gets really, really nice uh, and moving towards stuff like, you know, transactional DDL. But currently now, it is pretty solid. We're going to have like, you know, GA release, we'd say, yes, you can run this in production. You're not completely insane. Uh, but we have managed to do, you know, tuple releases every couple of weeks uh, that have come out there, and people have been using that. That's been fairly solid. Uh, and not a huge number of regressions hitting in, uh, or the bug inflow has been fairly, fairly steady, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, so it's kind of cool that we have something coming up that will actually be pretty solid. And the future of it looks bright, we hope. It's users, use Drizzle, please. <laughs> cool. Do we have any questions? In terms of those um, pluggable protocols, are you looking at anything to make it easier to write drivers? Because I know, for instance, I think Jeff's doing a talk later on about Node.js, which is this new thing where, like, they have one of the things they have trouble with is they have to write their own drivers for mm. things because they're compl it's completely asynchronous. So, uh, this you know, the standard. <laughs> MySQL driver is not asynchronous, so mm. they can't just plug it into Node.js. So would it be easier to have a new protocol that would make life a bit easier for that? Like, so when the next new thing comes along, it's not hard to create a driver for it because it has its own little, or it's got its different way of working? Yeah, I mean, we solved the driver problem in one way of also speaking the MySQL protocol. So everyone else has already written that for us. Uh, and doing more advanced things is, is like a next step, which is part of the thing working on in, in Drizzle protocol of being able to do things more asynchronously, which you can already start to do with the client library as well. Uh, so the client library is a lot faster and, and more advanced. But um, yeah, there's some, some things in there for the future which are going to require people sitting down and, and do fancy things. But for a moment, we've kind of got it covered in the fact that speak someone's protocol already makes it easier because software already exists. Um, but yeah, there will be stuff in the future that will be interesting for async stuff. And if someone writes a HTTP one, that will be interesting. Yeah. John? Um, at an SQL level, how compatible is Drizzle versus MySQL? So I mean, your average MySQL app that's not doing anything particularly tricky and special yeah. would just work, or is it going to need some hacking? Uh, so we don't do uh, SQL triggers, uh, views, on, or stored procedures yeah. is the big ones that we don't have that is in MySQL. Um, so if it's not using that and you're not, for example, you know, relying on data to be truncated uh, <laughs> and stuff like that, uh, then you're okay. Then it's basically the DDL that gets to be migrated and the drizzle dump tool can do that for you. Um, the main differences around that like, is DDL. Uh, but we've tried very hard to have like SQL level compatibility, except for when it's, you know, wrong, uh, in which case we will throw the error. Uh, we won't warning your data was truncated error, uh, which is the main difference. But we've seen, like, for example, WordPress, take a MySQL WordPress install, run the drizzle dump thing, and WordPress will still run against it. Uh, if it starts issuing create and alter table stuff, then that can be a bit more interesting. Um, but, you know, it'll run like that. One of the guys runs this blog like it. I'm nearly game enough to, you know, screw with something that works. <laughs> So we're fairly compatible on that level. Uh, does Oracle have much to do with the day-to-day -day development of Drizzle? None at all. OK. Yep. Uh, one or two people work for Oracle for a very short amount of time. <laughs> but yeah, Oracle is nothing to do with Drizzle. So there are plans to, like I know Rackspace is already doing some stuff with offering so software as service kind of thing, it, it would be really nice not to have to set up your own database. If, with this whole cloud thing is, is that you can just have a little console that says, I, I want one of these and or X number of these. Yeah. I imagine an plan? offering like that would go a, a great way towards uh, justifying my salary. Uh, so <laughs> there's a number of things around it that uh, Rackspace is looking at, including using it internally and for, you know, back end for running large, you know, cloud and stuff like that. So there's several things that will come out. But yeah, they're very Drizzle committed. It's awesome. Well, that's probably it. Thank you.